Thank you very much, uh, Victoria and Ken. Um, and thank you very much to Friends of the Dales for this opportunity to talk to you all about one of the major issues we currently face. In fact, arguably the major issue that we currently face. So I'm talking to you from my garden office just inside the Yorkshire Dales National Park in Long Preston. Um, some of you know the area, um, will know the view um, in the picture at the moment uh, of Long Preston Beck. It's one of my favourite pictures um, from the area and it's one I use quite a lot in, on my website and various other things as well. Um, just to put it in context, this picture's taken um, about two and a half miles upstream of here is Scalber Foss. Uh, two miles downstream is a confluence of Long Preston Beck with the River Ribble. Um, and the Beck joins the river just downstream of Long Preston Deeps. Now this afternoon we're talking about climate change, but it's important to remember that climate change is only one of a number of environmental and societal issues that we currently face. And, and all of those environmental issues are all linked. So Ken mentioned pollution um, and loss of habitat, really important issues. Um, and they're also very closely linked to climate change. And it's very difficult to deal with one of those issues without dealing with the others. Arguably, if we deal with climate change, we should be able to address some of those issues together. So um, before I get started too much, I just want to give you a little, a few minutes just to think about things. I want us to take time to reflect and think about what you want the Yorkshire Dales to be like in 2030. And I use 2030 advisedly because that's the time by which we need to have made significant changes to the way we currently do things. This may be something you've thought about a lot, but for now, just close your eyes for a couple of minutes and try to visualize what you want the Dales to feel like, to smell like, to sound like, and to offer residents and visitors in 2030. And try to think about it in terms of landscape, people, industry and business, housing and biodiversity. And I'm gonna shut up for a couple of minutes just while you close your eyes and you think about that and try and visualize what you want the Dales to look like over the next eight years. So um, we, we're gonna be talking about climate change. Um, this has become a much more familiar term over the past few years. Um, but climate change as a term doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me for a number of reasons because it implies something that's gradual, manageable and potentially beneficial. And this isn't the reality. Climate change will not be gradual. We're going to experience and see a series of tipping points. And a tipping point is a threshold that, if we cross it, causes a system to change from one state to another. And in this case, we're talking about the climate system, the atmospheric system that controls everything that we do. We're seeing some tipping points in, in, in that climatic system. And examples include, um, as the ice melts at the poles, both north and south poles, the white reflective surface is replaced by dark absorbent surfaces of the sea or of the land. And those darker surfaces absorb more heat and exacerbate the ice melt. And obviously as the ice melts, then that um, goes into the sea and that's leading to, to sea level rise. Um, it's leading to things like thermal expansion. So we're seeing increases in sea level as a result of that too. Another tipping point is that as forests become warmer, they dry out. This increases the risk of catastrophic fires, which in turn emit more carbon dioxide, which increases the heating effect. A scary fact is that if we continue with the deforestation rates we're currently experiencing in the Amazon, that by 2100, we could certainly be talking about a savanna landscape rather than a forest. And some commentators even suggest it could go as far as becoming the Amazon desert. Now, the, the, the consequences of the Amazon drying out to that extent are, are, are just unimaginable. And a third tipping point is that warmer temperatures melt permafrost, which releases significant quantities of methane. And methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. And an increase in methane in the atmosphere then spurs further warnings. So climate change will not be gradual. 
climate change will not be manageable. Here in the UK, we might just be moving towards the end of COVID being considered a major issue, but it still remains a serious and significant challenge across the rest of the world. And given how poorly we, we planned for and managed COVID, how prepared are we to manage a global catastrophe that will dwarf this one? Tipping points mean we can't predict the next major issue that we may have to deal with. If the Greenland ice sheet melts more rapidly than it currently is doing, this may lead to a reversal of what we call the ocean conveyor belt, and that will drag cold Arctic water down past the UK rather than the warm water of the Gulf Stream. And we may see temperatures get much colder. So rather than climate change leading to global warming, we could see in this area climate change leading to global cooling or to, to UK cooling. Interestingly, I was talking to a farmer the other day just up the Dale, just up, up, further up Ribblesdale. Um, and he was saying that um, at the time of, of the winter when, when his grass is hardly starting to grow, he can go up to Cumbria uh, and they have lots and lots of grass. And that's the effect of the, of the Gulf Stream coming down past Cumbria, which is warming the atmosphere and, and helping the grass to grow more effectively. If that, if that Gulf Stream switches round and becomes a cold current coming down from the north, then you know, what are we going to see as far as our farming and, and, and landscapes are concerned? We're also looking currently at the possible, uh, another possible major collapse of the Antarctic ice shelf. Uh, and this could speed sea level rise. Um, this would make many low lying areas uninhabitable within a relatively few, few years if this rate of change happens. And the speed of changes mean that species, and, and, and I include man, Homo sapiens, within that range of species, won't be able to adapt quickly enough leading to mass casualties and something we call the sixth mass extinction event. And as areas of the world becoming un uninhabitable, where do those displaced people go? Will we welcome them or will we pull up the drawbridge and install gun emplacements on the white cliffs? Interesting question to, to try and answer. And, and climate change will not be Put my slide slightly out of, out of kilter there. It won't be beneficial. It won't be beneficial to us in the Dales because we're not likely to experience a settled benign type of weather pattern such as we've been used to over the past couple of hundred years. Some people suggest the Mediterranean conditions for the area. We might be able to get our, our, our parasols out and, and, and do a bit of sunbathing, but I suspect it's going to be slightly less acceptable. Experience so far suggests that weather is likely to become much more extreme. We may see warmer weather, but it's likely to be in, in, in the case of heat waves and droughts. And we're going to get the opposite, the floods, we're going to get cold snaps and the winds are going to get stronger and more frequent. And if that on, o, ocean conveyor belt turns off, we may experience conditions which are more like northern Canada, which is on the similar sort of level of latitude as we are. And these changing conditions will put pressure on farms and other businesses. Existing housing stock may not be serviceable in changing conditions. We may have to accommodate internal climate migrants, as much of the east coast of the county may be underwater, and cities such as York may lo no longer be habitable due to persistent flooding. And we may have to accommodate a greater number of those external climate migrants as life becomes unbearable in sub-Saharan Africa, in parts of Asia, and as many small island states cease to exist. These pressures may all lead to social unrest and potential conflict. And we can't be insulated from that potential social unrest and potential conflict here in the Dales. So this is why I think the term climate breakdown is the wrong one. Sorry. Oh. Getting a bit mixed up with my slides here. So we should call climate change what it really is. And I've got a number of suggestions. The first one is climate breakdown. Climate breakdown because we're not just experiencing climate change, but significant changes in the atmospheric systems are leading to the climate as we've come to know it 
over the past few hundred years to actually break down. Those, those climatic systems are breaking. We could call it a climate crisis because we've reached the point where it's become a crisis. But few people with influence recognize this, or if they do, they choose not to acknowledge it publicly. We could call it a climate emergency. If we accept the climate's in crisis, we've reached the point where it's become an emergency and we have to act quickly. Greta Thunberg has pointed out, as many people in Australia and California will testify, that our house, the earth, is on fire. So why are we not acting accordingly? We could call it a climate catastrophe, perhaps not yet. Or perhaps the people in the Philippines who've just experienced Typhoon Ray would call it this. And maybe the relatives of people in central China who drowned in their underground trains in July last year might also think this is a catastrophe. And I'm sure the inhabitants of Tuvalu and other South Pacific Island states would call it a catastrophe because in a few years time, their islands will no longer exist. So, so why is this terminology important? I think it's important because words matter and what we call something dictates the action we take in response to it. Personally, I favour climate breakdown and I try to use this when I talk about the topic and in all the courses we develop as idea stone. But just for a few minutes, I want to talk about one of the other terms we've come to use, um, that of climate emergency. So in response to Greta Thunberg's Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion protests in 2019, all of the bodies listed here and many more have declared a climate emergency. Interestingly, given where we are, North Yorkshire County Council has not declared a climate emergency, but given their due, their website does outline quite a lot of the action they're taking to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. Many commercial organisations have also made similar declarations. Declaring a climate emergency implies that these organisations recognise the severity of the issue and will take action. But what's the reality? The reality is that China, India, the United States and many other nations continue to favour fossil fuel driven energy systems. Now, it's very, very easy to demonise China and, and, and say, you know, this is all China's fault, and, you know, if they would sort themselves out, we'd be all OK. The reality is that in China, they're actually installing more renewable energy capacity than the rest of the world combined. So, yes, they are still favouring fossil fuel driven energy systems, but they they are looking at renewable systems as well. So just be careful when, we, you know, when you hear people demonising China. We also see Boris Johnson flying from London to Glasgow and back several times in a private jet during the two weeks of COP26. That was the UN's major climate conference in November last year. The irony of it seems to be lost on him. We also saw more than 30,000 delegates, lobbyists, protesters, press and media representatives attending COP26, and the majority of them reached Scotland by air. Again, many of them still, seem, still fail to see the logic and, and, and join up the dots. The UK government's also failed to condemn potential development of a new coal field in Cumbria and also pledges to contribute £16 billion to promote further exploration for oil in the North Sea. Fortunately, the developers of the Cambo field have seen the er error of their ways um, and the potential conflict it might cause and, and have pulled out. We also see the development of HS2 which leads to loss of landscape features, loss of biodiversity and loss of livelihoods across much of the Midlands. And here, closer to home, North Yorkshire County Council and local councils support the construction of a new part of the A59 road at Kex Gill. When we move into a situation where individual motorised transport may no longer be feasible or acceptable, should we be spending millions of pounds on developing new road infrastructure? We need to think carefully about what this means, what declaring a climate emergency means and how we react to it. If we're going to declare a climate emergency, we need to put in place the policies that reflect that and do something about it.
So what should we do? Well, the policies that we need to put in place must reflect the severity and urgency of climate breakdown. For example, all, and I mean all, coal, oil and gas not yet exploited should be left in the ground. There should be no new oil wells drilled or mines sunk. If existing wells or mines can be closed safely, they should be. If wells or mines can't be closed safely at the moment, they should be managed to closure in as short a time as possible. Why is this necessary? It's necessary because of something we call the carbon budget. I'm not going to go into this in a great deal of detail because it gets quite complicated, but just a brief explanation of the term carbon budget. So global warming is fundamentally linked to the absolute concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. To stabilise global temperatures at any level when measured against pre-industrial levels, there's a finite amount of emissions that can be released before the net emissions need to reach zero. For carbon dioxide emissions, we refer to this as a carbon budget. Sounds quite complicated. What does it actually mean? As I said, calculating carbon budgets can become very complicated. Um, some of the diagrams that help to explain this can also become fairly complicated. So I've tried to make this fairly simple. This pie chart illustrates the amount of carbon we've emitted since the start of the Industrial Revolution, or that we could commit, we could emit until we reach um, saturation point. The blue portion there is the carbon emitted between 1781 and 1988. 1781, arguably the start of the Industrial Revolution. The orange sector is the amount of carbon we've emitted since, 90, since 1988. You can see those sectors are quite, quite similar. The yellow sector is the amount we can emit to keep temperatures below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the green sector is the amount we can emit to keep temperatures at or below one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. So just to put those in context, the carbon emissions between 1781 and 1988 were 737 gigatons. Since 1988, we've emitted a further 743 gigatons. To reach two degrees C, we can emit another 550 gigatons, which is less than we've emitted um, since 1988. And if we to reach one and a half degrees, which is the, the commitment from the, the, the Paris Climate Agreement, we've only got 205 gigatons of carbon dioxide left that we can emit. This is why we should be leaving all unexploited fossil fuels in the ground. So what should we do? As I say, the policies that we adopt must reflect the severity and urgency of climate breakdown. So as well as leaving all those unexploited fossil fuels in the ground, we also need to do things like discourage flying. We need to avoid developing any new airport capacity. And I hear you say, well, these have little to do with us in the national park, but many of us who live in this area don't think very hard before flying to Spain or further afield for our holidays. <clears throat> of potentially more relevance to us in the National Park is that very quickly before 2030, we do need to retrofit as many existing domestic, commercial and industrial buildings as possible. Retrofitting is um, providing insulation, moving to low energy lighting systems, low energy heating systems, removing gas boilers, um, installing renewable energy systems and all those sort of things. We need to do that retrofitting as quickly as we possibly can. Any buildings that aren't economic to retrofit should be earmarked for other uses. And all new buildings should be constructed to the highest thermal standards and incorporate, incorporate solar PV panels, car charging points, arguably, heat pumps and hydrogen heating, rainwater harvesting and all of those other, other things. Why we're not doing this with new housing already is a little bit beyond me. These are easy, relatively simple, relatively inexpensive technologies, and we should have been installing these on new, new dwellings, new buildings for at least the last 10 years. But I hear you say, or perhaps central government policymakers say, 
humans are ingenious. We'll find a technological fix for these problems. Let's have a quick look at this. Technology is our saviour. So we're currently in the middle of a massive uncontrolled experiment in our life support system. Uh, by that, I mean climate change. We, we, we've been emitting carbon dioxide at in unprecedented rates without really understanding what it was going to do. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's an experiment that, that is going horribly wrong at the moment. Um, so is another uncontrolled experiment the answer? I would say no, it probably isn't. Government policy for net zero carbon emissions by 2050, which is the aim that, that we have in place in the UK, is reliant upon something called carbon capture use and storage. It's reliant upon decarbonizing aviation fuel, something they interestingly call jet zero. And it's reliable on renewable energy systems. Now, renewable energy is a proven mature technology or majority of them are renew, re, proven mature technologies but they do require massive additional investment and a significant increase in the number of wind turbines, solar panels, tidal and wave energy installations. Are we prepared for wind turbines across the uplands of the Dales? Certainly the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority don't appear to be ready for it. Are we as inhabitants and people who care for the Dales ready for that? Carbon capture and storage is theoretically possible from major industrial installations, such as gas or coal-fired power stations, but, but nowhere in the world has anyone yet developed effective technology at scale. There are, there's an operational plant in Canada, but this is only economic because the carbon dioxide being injected to oil wells for storage is also being used to force out additional oil from the strata. So we're capturing the carbon dioxide, but we're using it to bring out more oil. There are some interesting developments in relation to aviation fuel, but many of these rely on biofuels. And on a diminishing area of cultivable land, remember more extreme weather and sea level rise is reducing the amount of land we have available. Do we want to use precious food growing areas for biofuel crops? And other more extreme geoengineering ideas, such as seeding the oceans with iron to encourage algal growth, firing sulfate particles into the atmosphere to whiten clouds, or constructing gigantic mirrors in space to reflect sunlight, shouldn't even be in discussion. But they are. So those uncontrolled experiments on the climate, they're uncontrolled because we, we, we can't control, we can't set them aside and say, if we do that, we'll see what happens and we can, we can go back to something else because that's not possible. So technology, yes, we are ingenious and technology may have some solutions for us. And um, certainly it will have some solutions in terms of renewable energy. I think we, we're gonna see further developments there, but you know, technology is potentially not, not our savior. So we mustn't forget that we are part of nature. Whatever solutions we devise, they will affect us. So climate change is affecting us. We're causing climate change, but climate change is having an impact on us. If we make changes, if we mitigate climate change, if we adapt to climate change, those solutions will also have an effect on, on us. We have to recognize that, that we are part of that process. But the for unfortunately, we've lost our connection with nature. We live in cities and towns and drive about in fossil fuel metal boxes, buying food in plastic boxes from sheds on the outskirts of town. We no longer have that connection with the landscape, with our food and generally with our life support systems. We mustn't forget that we are part of that nature. But we are the only species that can have a global impact on natural systems. And whatever we do to nature, we will reap the consequences. So coming back to what should we do? Those policies must reflect the severity and urgency of climate breakdown. And it must be at all levels, not just at governmental level. So if you're in business, those heavily remunerated 
chief executives should be earning their inflated remuneration packages by asking questions such as, can my business continue to operate in a decarbonized world? And some businesses will not be able to continue. What should my business look like and what should it do? How should it operate? Is my business regenerative? Farmers need to ask questions about whether they should be cultivating the land because ploughing releases significant amounts of carbon dioxide which is stored in the soil. And we need the soil to be that carbon dioxide store in the future. Should farmers be using even larger and heavier machines that consume vast amounts of fossil fuels? Or should they perhaps be moving to lighter, smaller machines and maybe sharing them and using them when they need it? Should we still be farming livestock that emits large amounts of methane or which denude the uplands of vegetation? As individuals, should we be moving towards much more efficient dwellings? Should we limit the amounts of flying or should we move to no flying at all? Should we increase the use of public transport? Should we adapt to a completely new transport system that's no longer reliant on cars, whether they're powered by fossil fuels, hybrid technologies or electricity? So what should you do? By you, I mean Friends of the Dales. What will Friends of the Dales look like in the coming months and years? Will policies adopted by Friends of the Dales reflect these changed situations? Will you work with individuals and other bodies to manage the transition? And how will this inform the response to planning and consultation? So coming back to where we started, it's time for you to think again about that, what you want the Dales to look like in 2030. Remember though, the status quo is not an option. Change is happening and the pace of change is accelerating. We cannot preserve this landscape. Arguably shouldn't be trying to because the landscape has been changing for, for decades, for hundreds of years. We have to be able to respond to that change. We have to be able to manage the change. We have to be able to help the change to meet the things that we need it to meet. So what do you want the Dales to look like, to smell like, to feel like, and to sound like, and to offer residents and visitors in 2030 and beyond? Some initial thoughts from me. Do we want more tree cover? Do we want healthy peat bogs? Do we want to see fewer tourists, but perhaps fewer tourists who will spend more and stay longer? Do we want to see more self-sufficient and resilient local communities? Do we want to see improved public transport, refreshed rail links, more buses, fewer cars? Do we want to see parts of the road network designated as green roads for cyclists and walkers? Do we want to see better communications? improved broadband, mobile coverage, using barn or, or, or similar technologies. We got some feedback from, from the earlier version of this talk that I gave to the Policy and Planning Committee. Um, and, and some of that feedback actually suggested that I'm not being nearly radical or imaginative enough. Some other ideas that were put forward included, um, the Dale should have a thriving center for digital businesses through a designated and promoted digital Dale served by world-class broadband, carbon neutral buildings and sustainable transport systems. Another idea was that the Dale should be acknowledged as a centre of excellence for upland land management, showcasing innovative farming practice and active cooperation between farmers and landowners. landowners. There should be much improved transport infrastructure involving increased train services and a network of electric buses. And many more areas should be managed for wildlife attracting wildlife holidays, as well as casual visitors. So, it's your turn. What do you want the Dales to look like in 2030? And what do you have to do to achieve it as individuals? How does Friends of the Dales use this to inform policies and plans for the next eight years? How do you work? How does Friends of the Dales work with other bodies local government, national park authorities. 
Perhaps if you've got some ideas, you've got things you'd like to share, you pop them into the chat room. We, I, we may have time to discuss some of these. We've certainly got some questions coming up. In the meantime, thank you very much for, for listening to me. Change is coming and it's up to us to manage it.